Reda Panova, tell us about the current death supervision in GCD. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and speak again four years later. So actually, four years ago when there was a, the previous semester, I gave, gave a talk about chronic ear coefficients on their own, like in combinatorics, knowing that they have some relevance to GCT, but back then I didn't really know exactly what the relevance is and what, how can they help, and now, Thanks to, thanks to that involvement, now we, we actually have some, some better understanding and so let me tell you what happened since for the past four years. But uh, because I doubt that anyone, may, may, some of you were here four years ago but you probably don't remember uh, <laughs> what we were talking about. Uh, so let me give you some basics from algebraic combinatorics, which is my field and, uh, and my perspective on these problems. Uh, so some of the, ba the basic objects in, com in algebraic combinatorics, this permutations and integer partitions, the symmetric group SN will be featured quite wi wi widely and uh, the general linear group as well. And uh, these are things that you've already seen in previous talks. The Young diagram of a partition is just an arrangement of boxes. And for us, it's going to be sort of important because that's a nice way to encode highest weight vectors and to visualize some, uh, th some things we know about representation theory. OK, so this is very basic. And uh, so already, Peter already talked about this, but let me take a step back. So what are group representations? In the, for example, in the case of the symmetric group, but in, in, for any type of group, these are ways to encode the group elements as matrices which obey the same group laws. So the ma matrices are quite universal objects. And for example, here is such a very, it's a very standard, actually, the permutation representation for, for the permutation group SN, uh, where it, the elements, the permutations are represented by their permutation matrices. So we all, all seen, seen this. This is an example of such a representation. And, uh, the point is that these representations can be, cons can be decomposed into irreducibles. So what does irreducible mean? This, these, are, these would be um, ways to choose, choose a basis for, for, for these representations such that when we the, um, change into this basis, the matrices will become block diagonal. And uh, the minimal such decomposition, so the smallest possible blocks we can um, decompose in, this would be the irreducible components. And so, for example, in this representation, there are two irreducible components. These are the vector spaces uh, spanned by the sum of the basis vector. This is so this would like one dimensional representation, the trivial one. And then this is the next, uh, the next interesting <coughs> representation, actually the thing, the sign representation here, um, with, with basis these vectors. And uh, in general, we know we have, cl we have classified the irreducible representations of the symmetric group, and these are the Specht modules. They correspond to integer partitions, all the partitions of lambda. And for example, in this case, we have S3. It turns out that V1 corresponds to the Specht module with one rope integer partition, and V2 is this other, uh, this, this other rep uh, representation, which would correspond to the partition to one. And, um, and the combinatorial way of thinking about this uh, Specht modules is via this object standard Young tableau. 
when we assign the numbers from 1 up to n to these boxes so, so that each number appears exactly once and they're increasing along rows and down columns. And these, these are indexing a basis of S lambda in some sense, but the operations are quite complicated, so it's not, uh, it's not so easy to describe what the representation actually is, even on this object. And uh, for, for what we will need later is, of course, the general linear group, and there, um, the reducible representations are also indexed by partitions lambda. They are the vial modules. And this time, however, the size of the partitions can be anything except that the number of parts is limited by the size of the um, general linear group. And uh, one tool that, may, that would be underlying maybe some of the results you will see later uh, in, in a way to study representations and in particular mul multiplicities of irreducible representations are the sure functions because they actually, they, uh, they, they are a basis for the ring of symmetric functions and they correspond one to one to this irreducible representation of the vial module. So if, if we, you can manipulate the sure functions, one can figure out exact, exactly in principle what the representations are. And they have some two types of formulas, like one of them is this ratio of van der Mondians. The other one is the combinatorial description in terms of semi-standard Young tableau. So these are again fillings of these diagrams cor the cor corresponding to these partitions with the numbers from one up to whatever the number of variables is here, except now the rule is that they have to be weakly increasing al along rows and strictly increasing down call. Okay, so you can look up on YouTube how to use. <laughs> so, from four years ago, I was explaining how to use this uh, sh these sure functions to figure out multiplicities in Kronecker, like Kronecker coefficients, and so on. So we are not going to do this now, <laughs> and uh, so now we will get to uh, the actual results. But um, before that, I need to define. Um, this, uh, the corresponding multiplicities. So the na natural thing to do is when you have two irreducible representation, take the tensor product of these representations is also a representation of the corresponding group. And hence, it can be decomposed into irreducibles. And the irreducibles will uh, come into isotypic components, we group the isotypic components all together and the number of times each isotypic component shows up is going to be the multiplicity of this component into this representation. And in particular, if we take two irreducible GLN representations, we tensor them and the, the multiplicities of the irreducibles are the so-called little Wood Richardson coefficients which actually have a nice combinatorial description and in computer science in complexity terms it means that um, uh, that calculating the uh, computing the little wood richardson coefficient is in sharp p and in fact here it turns out that deciding whether they are positive or not is uh, in p but this is this is a, an accident in some sense um, and uh, when we take a symmetric group uh, the symmetric group representations, the spec modules, we can decompose under the diagonal action again. And these are these Kronecker coefficients, which were featured in the title. And for example, you can do this by hand. One can take this, these two spec modules. It turns out that they, they decompose in this way to irreducible. So the corresponding Kronecker coefficients are all ones for these two partitions and any of the other ones. And uh, thanks to sure vial duality, um, the Kronecker coefficients also show up in the in GL representations, and this is how they will enter the business with uh, terminant and permanent later. 
and the platism coefficients correspond to compositions of representations. Uh, in general, they can be defined this way. So again, we are, fa we are ir uh, factoring into irreducibles. And these are the multiplicities of each irreducible. But for our purposes, we are only going to need these platism coefficients like the simplest possible rep rep compositions of representation. So the sym symmetric powers of the vector space. Okay, so the big problem was to figure out a positive combinatorial interpretation for the general linear, uh, for the Kronecker coefficients, and uh, or to even show that their computation is in sharp p. So far, we only know that it's in gap p. Originally, the motivation was that the, the Littlewood Richardson coefficient show up as subset, uh, as a special case of the Kronecker coefficients. And so one would, uh, of the, sorry, of the Littlewood Richardson coefficients, and so, uh, so that, that would pose a natural problem that these are non negative integers. We need to figure out what they, what they really count in a discrete way or just compute them in sharp p. And the uh, modern motivation is what we are interested in today is their their role in geometric complexity theory. And also the Kronecker coefficients show up in invariant theory in the study of moment polytopes. So this is one of the particular problems of interest. And there has been a lot of work along those lines that you, you, you will see more of later. So what do we know about the Kronecker coefficients so far? Basically nothing. <laughs> so we only know some very, very special cases that when we have some formulas and um, so only when like one partition is a very long, has a very long first row and it's just two rows with first row very long or is, is a hook and there are some other special cases that, that are of that level of parametrization. And we know some, some lower bounds, so in principle Kronecker coefficients can be really large. They, they can uh, be so they can grow exponentially, but we still don't have any criteria of when they're zero or not, for example. And um, here are the com so some of the complexity results. So in figuring out whether a Kronecker coefficient is positive is already an np hard problem, as people here have shown. Um, okay, so. How do they, what is their role in the in geometric complexity theory, which is what you already saw a little bit from yesterday in Peter's talk. So, uh, of course, the big problem is to separate VP from VNP. Um, and the determinant is the universal VP polynomial. There is a notion of determinantal complexity, which you already know. So here is an example. This polynomial can be evaluated as a determinant with question. Yes. On the previous slide, uh, you said that the positivity for uh, the problem is NP hard. Yeah. Earlier, you said some positivity question is in P. Uh, for Littlewood Richardson coefficient, okay. which are a special case of Kronecker, but. In general, the Kronecker coefficients are a lot more complicated. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so, any other questions? <laughs> okay, so, so here, uh, so we are looking, so the determinantal complexity, this is going to be just the size of the smallest determinant, which can evaluate our our polynomial such that the entries are a fine, a fine linear entries in the variables. And in this case, we, well, this polynomial can be evaluated with a two by two, the determinant of a two by two matrix, so determinantal complexity is two. <coughs> and uh, 
the relation to VP is that the polynomial is in VP if and only if the determinant of complexity is polynomial in, in the number of variables and the, the degree of the polynomial. And then there is the permanent. And the permanent is the universal VNP polynomial. Very, very similar to the determinant, of course, and that to show that VP is not equal to VNP, one can show that is equivalent to showing that the determinant or complexity of the permanent grows super polynomially in M. Okay, so now this makes a problem algebraic in the sense that um, we want to show that we cannot write the M by M permanent as as the determinant of an n by n matrix for any n that is polynomial in M. And um, so what we know so far, so Peter already showed, is that the determinantal complexity of the permanent is actually at most 2 to, two to the m, so it's already exponential. The best known lower bound is m squared over 2, so of course there is a big gap. Here, here is a formula which gives determinantal complexity about m, to, <coughs> m times 2 to the m for the permanent. Um, and th this is what we know. And now, how do we make the, so the algebraic version of the problem and geometric complexity theory? How was to study the orbit of the determinant under the action of GLN squared because, again, so we are replacing the entries by a fine linear combination, so it's natural to take the action of the general linear group. And so we have the determinantal polynomial. GLN acts on the variables in this, in this uh, form, and we are looking at the orbit. So all possible polynomials we can get in this way. But uh, these are so these are uh, invertible matrices in principle that these entries might not be invertible. So we need to take the orbit closure, and also we need we for the algebraic geometry we will need this to be a proper variety. And um, <clears throat> and here is the permanent. So we need to homogenize it in this case to, to, to get the, the, de the degrees of the polynomials too much. So we homogenize it with some one extra variable or could be the same, it doesn't really matter. And of course, if the permanent is not in the orbit closure of this n by n determinant, it means immediately that the ter determinantal complexity of the permanent is bigger than n. So this is the paradigm of GCTs to exploit this to get a lower bound for the complexity of the permanent. And here is the, the VP versus VNP version from, from GCT is that uh, the permanent does not belong, is not in the orbit closure of the determinant for any uh, polynomially sized n. And uh, so when permanent, permanent being in the orbit closure of the determinant, we can actually close take this, the orbit of the permanent as well and cons compare the two orbit closures. <coughs> okay, so here is the reformulation again. And now we use this representation theory that, that we already uh, discussed is to, to consider the GLN squared, the, the GLN squared action on this, on this uh, Varieties and take the coordinate coordinate rings on these these two varieties, decompose them into irreducibles and compare them, and see if we can find some lambda, some partition lambda such that the multiplicity in one is bigger than the multiplicity in the other, which will immediately show that. The second one cannot, con cannot cannot contain the first one. So, so this is the representation theoretical multiplicity obstruction is when 
when the multiplicity of an irreducible representation in the uh, coordinate ring of the orbit closure of the determinant is smaller than the <coughs> multiplicity of the irreducible representation, the corresponding irreducible representation in the, co in the coordinate ring of the orbit closure of the permanent in <laughs> gamma. And uh, so if, if this holds, then immediately we, we have uh, an immediate consequence that this, the orbit closure of the permanent cannot be so in some, in, at least in one, in one irreducible, this is bigger, so their containment cannot, this containment cannot happen. So, so then this, this existence of lambda will show that the determinantal complexity of the permanent is bigger than n. Okay. So, so we need to compare this delta and gamma that we actually don't know what they are. So here is the con these are the conjectures again, and the small the since we don't really have a good handle on these multiplicities, one hope was that there would be such our current subtractions when delta when we consider rep representations which do not show up at all in the determinant, but they show up in the permanent. This would obviously separate both, and um, and there was the the weaker conjecture of GCT was that there exists such occurrence obstructions, which we yesterday, Peter told you the punchline that it's wrong. <laughs> so this, this does not happen basically. For any lambda of interest, this delta lambda is, is po strictly positive. And uh, one way to get the handle on this uh, delta and gamma is using this chronic here and platism coefficients that I just mentioned. Since we don't really have a good handle of what these exactly are, and, but we know that so the, the so-called symmetric chronic here, this is actually the multiplicity of lambda in the orbit of the determinant. So not the orbit closure, but it would be an upper bound. And the symmetric chronic here is bounded above by the normal chronic here coefficient for two rectangular partitions. And the platism coefficients just, so th this would be the multiplicity of lambda in the ring of all, uh, in the, in, for the, ring of regular function in, on all, on all um, polynomials of degree n, so this would be an upper bound for, for, for the permanent in particular, but for actually any such padded polynomial. And um, and then the, there was a weaker conjecture that so not knowing exactly what this delta is, one can maybe hope that we get the Kronecker coefficient to be zero. This would immediately imply that delta is also zero, and this will. And if if uh, this uh, lambda shows up in the coordinate ring of the permanent, that would lead to a sub to a lower bound for the determinantal complexity. So this was the pre-conjecture, pre, pre and so before we proved the no occurrence obstructions with, uh, with Christian, we actually showed that if n is already bigger than 3m to the fourth, so, so even, so for, for that, uh, for that uh, inequal inequality between n and m, Basically, all interesting Kronecker coefficients are already positive, already for, for this lower bound. So we cannot use this paradigm to separate permanent from determinant. So Greta, which one yeah. of these is a stronger statement, this one here or the previous one? Or are they uh, so they are, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the no occurrence obstructions hold cells, maybe show it in the next slide, when n is bigger than m to the 25th. <laughs> okay. But this, 
this is too strong a requirement because, I mean, the real multiplicity is smaller than the, the chronic. So, so they are... Morally, if you just consider... Like, so, so morally, they... they, they um, uh, the, this, the two statements overlap, <laughs> but uh, there is a little, a little bit of discrepancies of when exactly they hold and right. okay. yeah. So, so if you just cared about, you know, can we get super polynomial separations, then the then the no occur uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. implies this version. Yeah. But this is saying. We can't but this this is up. this is already holding for <laughs> much lower degree, uh, much lower bound here. Also, that is the earlier statement. Yeah. So. This is the came before. This is, yeah, yeah. So okay. So so here is uh, here. So uh, I yeah. So the the cr cr the I, I'm trying to give the talk in a more chronological order. So how things were developed, also to explain where the intuition came from for the other for the other statement that Peter yes told, uh, told you yesterday. Uh, and he, okay, so here is the other statement. The other statement says that if n is bigger than m to the 25th, then this delta is zero. Uh, sorry, sorry. Then del delta is not zero, basically, for <coughs> for any partition of interest. Okay, so I will. So I will focus on this statement because Peter already explained how the other proof goes, and then I'll I'll show what I'll, I'll bl briefly mention how the other one goes. Well, and uh, then we'll move on to some other models that can be studied with GCT and similar multiplicities. So, how did we prove this statement? So. So we need to know something about the partitions of interest. What can occur in the, cor the coordinate ring of the orbit closure of the permanent? The only thing we need to know about the permanent is that it's actually a padded polynomial. So there is this x to the n minus m showing up there of much larger degree, which means that the partitions which would show up here, so they are related to how the what the monomials in the polynomial are, they need to have a very long first row. So first of all, the, le the length of the partitions have to be at most m to the squared because of the number of variables involved. And the body of the partition, so this is everything without the first row, has to be at most m times d. So this is the characterization we really we really use and, and nothing much more than that. And, and the other characterization we need is uh, what, what we call a, a degree, degree lower bound, which I will explain a little bit later and we get into inequality of multiplicities, but basically, for, at least for this result, we need to have the degree which so there is an implicit degree here. There is little d it has to be bigger than n over uh, than n over m. It is related to this bound here as well. And then we have to prove what when are the Kronecker coefficients positive, and it turns out that for partitions like that where we have a very long first row. Um, Already for this type of bound, we know that all Kronecker coefficients of interest are pos positive. So the Kronecker coefficients of interest are lambda and then rectangle and rectangle and by d and then by d rectangle. So how do we prove anything about Kronecker coefficients without really having any type of formula for them? And uh, yes. The first theorem about the permanent is true for any homogeneous polynomial? Or is it? Which? Which Landsberg is yeah. for any homogeneous polynomial? Any homogeneous, any padded homogeneous polynomial. Yeah. 
there is this does not use anything specific about the permanent other than it's some polynomial in m squared variables of degree m and then we are padding by and to by one variable and minus m. so nothing nothing else is used here which already means that probably we should <laughs> so so that's uh, any 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 any, any um, method that should separate determinant from permanent should should be a lot more specific than that somehow. Uh, so, so okay. So how do we use uh, uh, the little we know about chronic error coefficients? And there is one thing that is. Very crucial here is the so-called semi-group property. The semi-group property tells us that if we have a triple of partitions, maybe I can write this down. So, but, so if if we have some triple of partitions, let's say lambda mu nu and lambda prime mu prime mu prime with positive chronic error coefficients, then we can add them <coughs> part-wise and we get this inequality and in particular we get another positive chronic error coefficient. And there is one more property which only holds for chronic error coefficients and you can, and this is thanks to the symmetry group and no, nothing and very, uh, very particular is that we can actually transpose. So first of all, we can switch anything. Uh, this, this is symmetric in the three partitions, but we can also transpose two of them. And it is the same chronic error coefficient. It is obvious from the, from the, uh, from the symmetry group, but it's not obvious from any of the general linear interpretations. But so one property f follows from sure vial duality with the general linear group. The other one follows from the symmetry group, and there is no unified view on 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 both of this. So it's which makes it even more interesting. Okay, so. One, so what, what, can, what can we do here? Well, we know what to do at least with one row. This is the trivial representation. So we have some very basic um, ideas of, of when chronic error coefficients are, are positive. And basically, this is allowing us to, if we have some partition with a positive chronic error, like here is a square and a square, then we can actually extend these two ends of the partition and still get a positive chronic error coefficient. And this is thanks to this combination of these two facts that we can transpose, <coughs> add something, transpose again, add something, and so on. And so this is, this is how the proof goes. And, and, in this, in, and then we have the, the chronic error coefficient for rectangle, rectangle and the partition lambda with anything here small enough that we can even calculate um, is strictly positive. Okay, so now we know that our partitions have to have a, very, a long first row, but maybe not too long, and we, are, we have these rectangles A and B. How do we get these coefficients to be positive? The point is again to use this semi-group property and try to decompose this partition into building blocks, which for which we already know some positivity result. And one should be careful with decomposing rectangles because the only way we can decompose a rectangle is into two rectangles of the same height. So this, so there is implicit, inherently there are some number theoretic issues of how we can just how we can apply this semi-group property, but um, uh, with sufficient uh, so we can 
we maybe can, we we can uh, transpose the rectangles as, as well. So that's how we get varying lengths of, uh, and heights of rectangles. So here is how the decomposition goes. So nu is the body of the partition. So nu is everything except for the first row. So we split it into squares and col columns of uh, width 2. And we use the following positivity fact. So first of all, this is, so this is one non very non-trivial result that the Kronecker coefficient for three squares is positive. And in fact, for tri tri triple of, parti of equal symmetric partitions is actually also true. Then we can do these transpositions, as I was just saying, with, with this rectangle so that we can get arbitrary. I mean, in the end, we, ha we need to have this size of rectangle, so we need to match things right. And, and then um, we have the various hooks, ex exceptional cases, and little partitions for whatever would not fit into that type of decomposition of the partition. And, uh, and in the end, we glue things together thanks to the semi-group property. So this is, these are the ideas and how exactly we decompose and all this. Is these are technical details, but basically this, this, the, the squares are ensuring that the lar large chunks of the partitions give positive Kronecker coefficients and the rest <coughs> is just to make sure we fill the gaps correctly. And, um, so this degree lower bound that I mentioned earlier, it is, it's an interesting consequence because one can actually show using complexity theory that the chronic here is actually bigger than the platism. So how does this work? Let me just show you quickly. So suppose that the, this chronic here, so first of all, chronic here coefficients stabilize as well as platism coefficients when we grow the first, the, per, the first part of the partition and the rectangles and one dimension on the rectangles. If these things grow, eventually they become constant, both for the partition, for the chronicers and the platism. So suppose where we are in the stable range already, then this inequality holds. So suppose it's, we have things going the other way. So the chronic here is smaller than this platism. Then we can use this, the Scottish Landsberg result. So, um, so there is, there is a there is a particular lifting then the multiplicity of this lambda in the coordinate ring here for basically these are this is going to be all these <coughs> padded polynomials this is going to be greater than or equal to the smaller platism coefficient so this is a li particular lifting we have this stability result so this mu this is Lambda when lambda grows beyond the stability range, so we already we are already there. And the last thing is GCT or in general the complexity theory that say, saying that if the multiplicity of lambda here is bigger than the Kronecker, which is bigger than the determinant multiplicity, it means that the, the Terminental complexity, this gives a lower bound for the determinantal complexity. So there exists some polynomial in this, uh, among, among these, these ones here, such that its determinantal complexity is bigger than n for one of these polynomials. Vm is just all degree m polynomials in m squared variables, so nothing particular to the permanent. And then we get the following. So then the multiplicity here is bigger, is uh, bigger, is already so bigger than the chronic here. And, uh, but this holds for every n because as we said, we already have n is in the stable range, which means that 
the determinantal complexity for this polynomial is bigger than n for any n goes to infinity, which is impossible. This is um, already. So it has to be. It has to be finite. So this is uh, what Peter explained yesterday of how the no, the stronger stronger no occurrence obstruction result holds, but with a weaker bound <laughs> in some sense. Um, so he already gave the proof yesterday. The only thing he didn't explain is how we exactly we were constructing. The, we needed to show that some platism coefficients were positive. It, it amounts to ten, so tensor contractions with certain specific tableau construction. So that's uh, a technical aspect. And uh, the last five minutes, I just wanted to sh show you another model. So when we don't want to deal with this padding, which was obviously making things too too easy, it, 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 well, <clears throat> so we don't want to have to deal with these lambdas with lo very long first rows. So let's take this, the power of a, matri of a matrix x to the m. So we can talk about instead of determin determinant, replace this with the power of a matrix. There is a, the power, comp so power complexity in some sense. Again, it's the smallest size matrix for which we can compute our polynomial, in particular the permanent, in this fashion. And, uh, and it turns out that this PC and the, and the determinantal complexity are polynomially equivalent, so if you want to separate VP from VNP, we can look at this PC instead. And then the same type of setup to, to look at the orbit closure of the permanent versus the orbit closure of the power of a matrix. And now there is no padding anymore. Okay, so what happens now? Well, so we, we don't actually know what happens in the orbit closure, but we can look at what happens in the orbit. And, and the, or, the orbit, the multiplicities of the irreducibles can be used by calculating the stabilizer, and it turned out they are given by this formula. This SK are the symmetric Kronecker coefficients. So it's actually a big sum here. And what turns out that everything is positive already for a, for a linear bound in this case. So all this, every, every partition that could possibly show up in here is already positive. So what are the restrictions now? We don't have this padding, so the only restriction that remains is just from the number of variables involved, that the length of lambda is at most m squared. And basically, in all these cases, this, this uh, multiplicity here turns out to be strictly positive, so we cannot rule out obstructions for this, with this method. And uh, the way it works, the way, the way we prove this positivity, so we, we know even less about the symmetric Kronecker coefficients. We didn't even know how they behave for like co column and row partitions or something simple like that. But um, this, again, we use semi-group property, not for the, chronic, the, the symmetric Kronecker's, but for this entire sum one can use the highest weight <coughs> vectors to show this um, semi-group property for, for the total coefficient. And then we needed to, to find something, uh, to find a rule at least to compute some symmetric Kronecker coefficients, and one was with, uh, when a partition is one column, and then there is an, exp so we can say exactly when this is, so this is gonna be one or zero. And we have the situation. It again uses some way of evaluating this with the block constructions. And we get this positivity result. And uh, 
I will stop here with this slide which has uh, which, which has a conjecture and a formula to extend this approach to the iterated matrix multiplication and uh, I'm out of time, so thank you. <laughs> Instead of uh, I and N, uh, have people considered the symmetric polynomial, elementary symmetric polynomial uh, in the place of the determinant? I don't know of anyone. I mean, we haven't. <laughs> so. Is that a universal? Is it yeah, universal? Yeah. It is. Okay, then maybe we, we should. Have nicer symmetries uh, by definition. Yeah, maybe maybe it would be easier to compute these multiplicities. Yeah, that's yeah. So both this, uh, the, the previous result also was working with the padding permanent, or it was no? No, longer so that there was no padding. So the only issue was, so this there is no padding here. So then the theorem is specific to the permanent, or it also applies for any homogeneous. It also applies for any homogeneous polynomial of degree m and m squared variables. <laughs> An issue like where you have like a padding, and here you have much more uh, variables for uh, iterate matrix multiplication than for your original. So it's just that all the multiplicities here are positive in the in the power, and uh, and then then you need you need some multiplicity obstruction or well, one also needs to go to the or, to the closure which we haven't done but uh, yeah uh, another model uh, is a uh, sum of powers of linear forms so wearing a ring basically uh, and of course lower bounds are known uh, uh, using partial derivatives uh, have you tried uh, this uh, uh, Yes. Well, that's so. Let me. Ah, <laughs> okay. So it's actually, what? So Peter <coughs> Peter explained this yesterday, and so that we. But there's no need for padding, right? So <coughs> if you try, try to represent the permanent as the sum of linear powers of linear forms, and you don't have to. So there is a way to. Uh, so. So if. <laughs> so how how do we <laughs> so um, so that so basically the the way we we proved this result was actually to show that the powers power sums appear in this orbit closure of the determinant and uh, and basically what. So what we showed is that we cannot actually. What is the last leg? Do, rank, do the, <laughs> the last slide? What is the result for iterated matrix multiplication? So this is the formula for the multiplicity. Again, it's this is not closure. This is what? This is so. Oh, you don't take the closure. We cannot. We cannot do the. We cannot do the multiplicity in in the case of the closure. So this is not the. This is not the closure, and the, the this the multiplicity of lambda here is equal to this big sum, or this small tiny little with Richardson coefficients and it's chronic also in product the of chronic of the matrix power, we have no idea how to characterize these multiplicities when you have orbit closure. Yeah. yeah. No clue. So let's stick all of the discussions so, in the break. Thank you. Thank you.